what this makes you think about with regard to the education of neurodivergent bilingual students. Um, the accommodations research, timing, scheduling, and setting, timing, scheduling, so extra time, um, and setting accommodations are most common. Now, setting refers to allowing students to sit in small groups, go into a separate room. These were not specifically designed to address the linguistic needs of emergent bilinguals, but rather were designed for students in special education programs. Um, so 34 states currently permit some type of, of accommodations, and of these, 22 allow only non-linguistic <coughs> accommodations. So no translations, no glossaries. So even in states permitting test translations like New York, students, um, oh yeah, I wanted to remember to tell you this, Students are required to respond monolingually on paper. Now, I know that there are practices in schools where you allow your students to trans language in their responses and you don't mark them um, off for doing so, and I would support that. However, the, there, there's been very little guidance from the state, um, but for, in many schools, I see students, at, students being asked what language they would like to receive a test in if they speak one of the five languages that we have for tr test translations in, and then they have to pick, and they get one or the other. They don't get both. But you can give them both. So I just want to put that out there. You can give them both. Right? But altogether, I think we still, what you still need to keep in mind is that none of these, all of the accommodations being used, still fail to fully close the quote-unquote achievement gap between emergent bilinguals and other students. Do you want to try this one? <laughs> so we're not just talking about math, right? People think, oh, math, it's a universal language, everyone can understand it. Uh, that, as you saw with the case of Hungarian word problem, that's not the, that's not the case. Science as well includes lots and lots of language. So, here are some of the failed policy, policy pro problems of what the quote-unquote achievement gap. It really bothers me how much this term is talked about. Um, but the gap on state English exams is 46 percentage points and 30 percentage points in math. Where So what that means is that emer um, emergent bilinguals are performing 40 percentage points below other students in the state on um, the English exams for grades 3 to 8 and 30 percentage points below in math. Graduation rates on the statewide are lower, 40% for emergent bilinguals as compared to 75% statewide. Dropout rates are higher, 33% as compared to 17% for emergent bilinguals than for other students. And the dropout rate has increased by 14% post No Child Left Behind. This is a social justice issue in my view. Um, it's one that we, as I said before, really need to resist. So I want to switch gears and clarify something that we began talking about when I presented last week in our last session together, but also just that um, we've been talking about throughout all of the seminars and throughout all of Ophelia's presentations until now, that emergent bilinguals who have the opportunity to receive home language instruction are actually likely to outperform their counterparts receiving English-only instruction. And the skills that students acquire in the home languages are found to quote-unquote transfer to English. They're skills. They're skills. These are not t entirely separate L1, L2, as Ophelia was clarifying this morning. We don't have fully separated languages. A skill is a skill. In whichever language you develop it in, you have it. Um, for, and this, the research is particularly strong on the, on, in reading and on reading skills. Um, so translanguaging really takes this further to clarify how all content learning becomes part of an integrated, a unified, and a united linguistic system. English-only programs, on the other hand, which really don't, which do not incorporate the home language practices of students at all, result in monolingualism over time, come at great emotional cost to students and their families, and often prevent emergent bilinguals from acquiring the academic language that schools demand. So this is, you know, Ophelia talks a lot about the banyan tree and the metaphor that she gave earlier on. This is the intertwining of those languages. That home language instruction is actually going to support your students' um, academic English. Acquisition. I realize that's a counterintuitive concept for a lot of people. 
But research shows that emergent bilinguals who receive home language instruction in school uh, typically acquire academic English more effectively. Many people seem to think that if you want a child to learn English, you need to immerse them solely in English, and that they will learn English better, but the research is quite clear that that is actually the opposite might be true. So here's an example. Um, Crash and, and McField did a meta-meta analysis. Um, a meta-analysis is where you, you analyze a number of different studies, all of the different research studies that they can find on a topic. So what Crash and McField did was they, they found um, five meta-analyses that had already been conducted comparing um, English reading performance of students in some form of bilingual education versus students in some form of English-only instruction. Um, and they then analyzed all five of those meta-analyses, and this is what they found. ES is the effect size, N is the number of studies that though each of those studies analyzed. Um, and what they found was that by about a quarter of a point in terms of effect size, students in the bilingual programs or students receiving bilingual support were able to outperform their peers in English, um, only programming in the area of reading in English, on exams in English. Uh, however, um, for many people, the belief, like I said before, there's this misperception that in order for students to perform well on tests administered in English, particularly these very high-stakes tests that we're all working with, that um, many people believe that English-only instruction will help their, to prepare their students better. And so what we've seen, and this is research, uh, this is data I shared last time, what we've seen is a dramatic loss of bilingual education programs in New York City schools since the passage of No Child Left Behind. Whereas actually in about 2000, it was about 50-50. Half of all students were, all emergent bilinguals were in some form of bilingual education, and half were in English uh, ESL programs. <laughs> and now it's 70% of all emergent bilinguals are enrolled in ESL programs, and 22% um, are enrolled in some form <laughs> of bilingual education. <laughs> Particularly large has been the loss of, um, significant has been the loss of dual, um, sorry, transitional bilingual education programs. That's where we've seen the greatest loss. Dual language bilingual programs have increased very, very slightly, but still only 3% of all emergent bilinguals in the city have the opportunity to participate in those programs. So I think, um, I, you know, I want to unpack a little bit how No Child Left Behind becomes language policy. Um, what we know is that in New York and nationally, the vast majority of emergent bilinguals receive instruction in English only. Now, I think it's important to keep in mind that ESL programs don't have to be English only. We're giving you a big green light here to say, use the home languages, incorporate the home language practices, and create spaces for translanguaging, even in programs that call themselves ESL. And we know that that's actually already happening, but in the traditional definition, ESL is English only, and that happens behind closed doors. We're trying to tra change that definition. Um, so whatever you call your program, there are always spaces for incorporating the home, lang the home language practices of the students and using those strategically. Um, so the vast majority of students, however, receive instruction that is English only. And I conducted a research study, and I wanted to share with you some of the voices of your colleagues, principals in schools in Europe that have chosen to eliminate their bilingual education programs in the wake of No Child Left Behind. Um, and accountability was the number one reason that principals cited, that um, they felt the pressures of accountability meant that they should actually be increasing English instruction and promoting English-only instruction for their students. What we found were bilingual education programs are immediately blamed when emergent bilinguals um, don't perform well on accountability measures. And this is largely due to ideology or beliefs rather than actual data. Many practitioners believe the best way to prepare emergent bilinguals for exam ad administered in English is through this you know, monolingual in English instruction. And the accountability system disproportionately penalizes emergent bilinguals and the schools they attend, creating a disincentive for schools to serve these students at all. Mm -hmm. So in the extreme, we found schools that simply refuse to admit them. So 
So here's an example of a quotation from a principal. Uh, this is actually an assistant principal of a junior high school where of that of blaming of bilingual programs, that where some of these things are politically and data-driven without being data-based. And I asked her, in this particular school, two-thirds of students had previously been enrolled in ESL. One-third, just one-third, had been in the bilingual education program. And I asked her, well, how did the students... How did the two-thirds of kids in the ESL program do in comparison with the kids in the bilingual program? And this junior high school assistant principal had really been the one to promote the elimination of the bilingual program. She's like, well, this goes back so many years ago, three years ago. I don't know. All I know is our schools weren't as successful as they should have been. So the data, they had never actually taken the time to compare performance of the students by program model to see if um, it was indeed because of language medium of instruction. <coughs> There's also a belief that English-only instruction will improve performance. And um, one of the assistant principals I interviewed said, when I asked her why they had chosen to eliminate their bilingual program, said, I think it was numbers. There was a perception, real or not, that emergent bilinguals were bringing the numbers down. But the idea that like, if you're in an English-only environment, you'll learn English quicker. This is a very, very prevalent um, ideology, and again, I think it's an example of how you know our thinking in this work has been very greatly affected by what's happening nationally in the political context as well. And then here's an example of that disincentive to serve emergent bilinguals, how the students have really been framed as a liability within the current climate. This principal said, we send L's back to the region and they move to another school. What I do is I call the placement center and they work with me. So, with my mouth on the floor. So, in general, you think it's better not to take English learners, or is it? It's much better. It's much better. <laughs> what I mean is, I don't have to worry about student graduation for the L population, and so he goes on and lists other things related to the accountability pressures that there are. For the sake of comparison, we also interviewed some um, principals who have continued to promote bilingual bilingualism in education within the current climate. And one of those principals said about her program, which has a dual language bilingual education program, I think generally speaking, there's a backlash against bilingual education. I think it's a matter of educating them, meaning principals. I think people feel that the only way to ensure that students do well is to teach them in English. And I think we're an example of that that's not true. So the data from that school is very strong. Um, and here's another example of sort of what I think of now as resistance within the current climate. Home language instruction for English academic achievement. This is an example I shared with you in our last session of Mr. C at a high school. He says we've been very successful because this school has chosen to give students extra Spanish classes to prepare for English regions exams. We've gone from very poor performing, approximately 23% pass rate, to a 74% passing rate on the English regions with the extra Spanish classes. So they had, for example, an English regions <coughs> prep class in Spanish, because theirs was a school where all of the emergent bilinguals are Latinos, and so what they did then was to build on that as a resource in their preparation for the exams. In addition, they also um, systematically funneled all of their emergent bilingual students through advanced placement Spanish courses the advanced placement Spanish language and courses because they found that the uh, skills emphasized on those AP exams were the same set of skills as those emphasized on the English regions. And so... <coughs> May I have your attention? May I have your attention? This is Emergency Action Plan Director. At the fire station, we received an alarm from the first floor pool station. We are currently investigating this alarm. And we'll get back to you with a follow-up message. Please stand by. <laughs> okay, I'll talk really, really quickly. <laughs> 90% of people have seen women swimming. Wrapping up, they will let us know if we need to go back to the police alarm. What they found at this school was that 90% 90% of children who were able to pass the advanced placement literature exam also passed the English Regents exam. Same skills, right? 
Um, and this school was so successful that, that um, by increasing their pass rates by 50 percentage points, uh,